Okay, let's take a look at an example of a motherboard here. This is an ATX motherboard that allows for Intel processors only, not AMD. And when it comes to knowing your processors and your motherboards, you have to make sure that they match up. So AMD processors could not work with this as it has an LGA 1155 socket for the processor here. And it also allows for DDR3 RAM up here in the RAM modules. So make sure that when you are matching those up that you not only are looking at the form factors but also the brands for the processors. Here is a, another board. This is a micro ATX here, so you can see the differences in size. We'll go over those specifically in later lessons, but you can just tell by the looks of the, the two that this micro ATX is much smaller. Now let's take a look at some information about drives, the cables, the different connectors, and as I said earlier, there are a couple different hard drive standards. When it comes to hard drives, we use that term for the drives that have the spinning disks in them. And really the two standards that you may see out in the field is the SATA or Serial ATA standard and that's pretty much what you should see because they're faster and more prominent than the parallel ATA so you shouldn't see those hopefully at all but you may have to upgrade those or try to get a customer to upgrade their system and these PETAs are just it's legacy technology. They use an, what's called an IDE interface that uses a 40 pin ribbon connector and, you, and we'll show you an example of this in the next slide. It's really clunky um, but it's what we started with so hopefully you will only see SATAs but if you come across a PETA at least you'll know what it is um, but it is much older and you'll be able to identify those right away with the 40 pin cable and connector. SATAs will use that uh, as I showed you in a previous slide, the SATA connection on the motherboard, the L-shaped connector, and it will use a SATA power connector as well. Let's take a look at a PETA drive now. You'll see much, there's all these pins, you have jumpers, there's that four pin I was telling you about, and you can identify this, you can see that red, black, black, and yellow for the power for this device. And you'll see that on a PETA connector here, you have a notch here to help you get it into the right position for your data to transfer. And you can see that notch is right there. You can see the notch there. And you see how we have a blank here as it is not a female port. And if you look at the drive itself, there is that blank. So visually you should be able to identify and correctly connect those pretty easy, but I have seen people try to do those incorrectly. Take another look at a setup with that. And you see this big ribbon, it's real clunky, it takes away a lot of breathing room inside the computer because that blocks a lot of the airflow that goes through. But you can see how we have a hard drive here that is connected, and we have a second spot on here for another hard drive to be able to connect there. And that's one of the reasons for those pin connectors on the back for you to be able to adjust to what the drive is so it can be identified as the primary hard drive, secondary hard drive, or primary hard drive, slave hard drive. And you also have over here, you see we have an optical drive, the CD-ROM here is connected with this IDE cable. As well here, you can also see that we have we can connect a second device on this cable as well and that they plug into the motherboard for transferring that data to our PC. On the flip side of that, the SATA, you can see that as I said earlier you may see different types of these but this is a SATA and here we have our power and our data ports here and you can see if you could zoom in, you'll see that we have a 7 pin and a 15 pin. So make sure that you can recognize those and know how many pins are in each of your SATA cables. And we'll talk about these in later lessons as well. But for the most part, you, here's how you identify these SATA drives because of those L shaped connectors. 
and this is a two and a half inch which is typically going to go into your laptops and this is a three and a half inch hard drive that will typically go in your desktops. Here's one connected. You have this serial ATA cable going to the motherboard there and you see that L-shaped connector that's how you can easily get that inserted so you can identify that. And as I said earlier, you can usually read the motherboard to know what's supposed to be plugged in. The reason that this part is important, if you are hooking up multiple devices, let's say you have multiple hard drives, you may need to go into the BIOS to make sure that that port is active. And then we have the SATA power cable going from the power supply to our device there. So we have this 7-pin data cable and we have our 15-pin power SATA cable. So make sure you're able to remember those in the future. Now let's move on to looking at laptops. And we have many flavors of laptops out there. Lots of brands such as Apple, Dell, we have HP, we have the Microsoft has their own flavor. Lots of brands, lots of different types of laptops, so you will definitely be working on laptops and need to know about laptops as a technician. You will definitely come across a lot of different types of laptops out there in the workforce. You have some that have a rotating display so they can do double duty as a tablet or a laptop computer or you may even see some that have the touch screens. You may see some that are have the 10 key number pad added to them, some without. Lots of different varieties, different ports on different brands, different ports on different models. So just have to the best thing I can say is to always refer to the manufacturer's publishings for working on those laptops. Now Dell, as a matter of fact, has really great support in that, let's say you're going to change a hard drive out on a specific laptop, they give step-by-step -step instructions, usually with really good graphics, for working on that specific model. Uh, Apple, of course, has their knowledge base out there, but of course they want to try to get you to send it in or take it to an a store for work on that um, and it's a little bit harder to work on some of the Apple products but we see lots of different complications with all kinds of different models so always refer to the manufacturers documentation alright let's take a look just an example as you see here we have this Sony laptop here and it has all kinds of different connectors uh, we have SD card slots for more storage. We have our Ethernet port, which is pretty much um, a lot of laptops are going away from having that and solely depending on the wireless. You can see that this one has the high quality HDMI display port on it. We have a VGA as well. So the only difference is audio and audio, audio and video can go through this. Analog video is all that can go through our VGA port. We have some USB 3.0 ports on here as well as a USB 2.0 and of course our power jacks or DC jack for that direct current. Now you'll a lot of times these power jacks are in many different locations unfortunately the power jacks are a big troubleshooting issue where people bump them or drop them while it's plugged in and then the power connector comes unsoldered from the motherboard and you can see sparks and stuff like that so it can be a dangerous situation. We have speaker ports and microphone ports here for that audio and we have a cable lock so that we can secure our device to our desk or table or whatever using a cable lock um, that we have to buy separately. If you've never used one you might look those up. They're a great item to have especially in a environment where there could be a chance for theft or a history of theft. You want to make sure to secure those assets if you are allowed to sometimes it's good to put that into your IT policy that devices are secured using a cable lock. Alright, so some of those common ports we've talked about that are on laptops, USBs, we see different versions of that on laptops. Firewire, you see that on some. Uh, network, which I said is kind of going away from the design on a lot of laptops. Uh, typically won't see too many modem dial-up connections, but you may. Audio, of course, and video. 
We have a lot of these that have the slots for the flash memory, um, as so you can take that memory with you. Uh, you know, you put some stuff on the card, you might take it out. Uh, let's say you have trail cams on your property, or at a business, and you have some type of cameras that have the flash memory cards in them. You may take your laptop to those, take it out of the device, transfer the data onto your laptop, and then clear the card, put it back into that device and then go on. The memory cards are great and a lot of devices have these flash memory cards. Uh, you have a, you might see that you're missing something like you want to be able to do something but you don't have that port or slot on your on your laptop you can still expand on that a little bit using USB dongles to get that type of connection you need. And I have an example here where we have an RJ45 network port that takes a USB so we plug this into the USB port on the PC and now we can plug an RJ45 Ethernet cable into that for networking. Let's say our wireless card is bad rather than trying to say we can't find one for our model we can go to this and we can still plug in our RJ45 to have our LAN connection. But What if our wireless card is bad on our laptop but we still need we want to have wireless? Well we have the ability to use get a USB device for that as well and you can get these in different kinds uh, different brands just make sure you do the research on them to make sure that you are compatible with the wireless technology environment that you're in and that it's something that will work obviously troubleshooting wise and experience will tell you this can be bad if they forget to unplug it and they throw it into their backpack or uh, carrying device carrying apparatus and then it breaks the antenna or breaks the USB port so you have to educate individuals as needed on our devices we have special buttons that can be used a lot of times you'll see that your keys on your laptops have raised numbers or characters above them or you'll see some icons next to the functions so we have special settings for our keyboards to talk with our operating system so we can do things uh, such as adjust our volume up and down let's see we can turn the keyboard backlight off we can adjust the brightness of our screen or we can even use special keys to flip the screen around and orient that in a different way if we are presenting and we have multiple displays to use we can toggle that feature as well we can turn off or on our Bluetooth and Wi-Fi with special keys same way GPS and different other options now, express card slots are used as well and we have two different sizes for that and we have the express card 34 and express card 54 and these can be used for different devices and you can look up some of those but before we got into USBs a lot of times people use these express cards or to use different features for having those and you can look up a lot of different varieties of these so if you need that peripheral device connected and you don't have the ability with your current setup you might need to use one of those express cards and get a, get the right one you need for that peripheral device and this could be like a modem or some type of network card uh, lots of different TV tuners are used here as well so a lot of different options for those express card slots and the reason we call them express card 34 and express card 54 is based on the size of the cards. The 54 is 54 millimeters wide and the 34 is 34 millimeters wide. So you can get an example of one, let's like say an Express Card 54 card that allows you to have SATA drive connections using your expansion card slot or your Express Card slot. So there's, if you need that peripheral device or other socket, you may have to go through your Express Card slots to use this. Another really helpful peripheral device is a docking station. These are great in the business environment. I have one at home and in the office to be able to just take my laptop, set it there, and I don't have to plug anything back into my laptop or take it out when I leave. It's all into that docking station. And you can see there's all kinds of different ports that you can connect to. Let's say you have an old PS2 mouse, you can plug it in there. Let's say you have a Ethernet cable and you you want to use your Ethernet connection rather than your wireless. You can have your Ethernet cable plugged in there. Let's say you got H or DVI monitors. You plug them in there. Once you set your laptop into the docking station, 
you have access to utilize all those peripheral devices rather than t plugging them in individually to your laptop every time you sit down at your desk. So it's definitely a worthwhile investment to invest in a docking station, especially in the business world. Here are some of those internal components. If we took off the cover to our PC or our laptop, generally underneath it can be anywhere from one to four screws uh, based on the model. Uh, but once you take that undercover off, you'll see access to a lot of things. You'll say, oh, well, this looks awful familiar to a desktop because I have a motherboard here. Well, if we look at some of the other items that we've already talked about, you might see something similar. You see that we have a CPU fan keeping the heat away from our CPU. You'll see we have, here is the, the screw area. The screw is sitting right there next to the hole. You see this one has two that it connected to for securing this undercover to the bottom of our PC. Here's our hard drive. Our two and a half inch hard drive is housed in this cradle and it's secured with the pins. You have the tab here to help pull that back so you disconnect and then you can lift out. That way you're very safe with what you're doing. We have a wireless card down here and typically the antennas are going to go up through the monitor or the top lid of your laptop we have RAM, so these are SODIMs, and we'll go over into SODIM RAM later on, but this is the type of RAM we have in our PC, and this has two slots so that we have different abilities for how much RAM we want to put in our PC based on the manufacturer's guidelines. Now how about all-in-one computers? Some people like them, some people don't really the premises of this is hey an all-one computer is a mix of components sized for a desktop and a laptop so for some components you'll need to buy replacements from the manufacturer because they are most likely proprietary once again refer to your manufacturer's service directions on how to do this because you do not want to go into an all-in-one computer to start tearing it apart. You want to make sure you do it correctly and in a lot of cases certain steps must be followed for taking those. But generally speaking, an all-in-one computer, you have your screen, you have all your ports, they could be on the sides, they could be in the back, there could be some in the top. It just varies. And like this one here is using Bluetooth for its keyboard and mouth and this is a touch screen as well so you can easily move around whether you're using your hand on the screen or you're using the input mouse device here. So all in one pros and cons, you know, if something goes wrong inside, the whole thing's down. Uh, and it may be harder to get what's needed to fix them. But they are a space saver. As we look inside here, we see recognizable parts here. Here's the CMOS battery. You'll see this in every computer generally speaking. Uh, a lot of them will be the CR2032 batteries. We'll go more into the CMOS and the BIOS later, but the CMOS battery troubleshooting wise, if you turn on your PC and you see that your date and time are way off, like years off, then it's a good uh, indication that your CMOS battery may be at fault and you need to change that out. We have a CPU fan here, once again pulling the heat away from everything and pushing it out into the open space. Under our heat sink here is our processor. Here's our power supply. Much different look in this all-in-one than we saw in the desktop. We have an optical drive here, probably a CD or DVD. You can see our hard drive is located way under here. And this is this one here takes a three and a half inch, not a two and a half inch, like previously mentioned in the laptops. And we have a bracket or casing here that will hold our hard drive in place. Here's our input output controller here. So on the side of this we would find different ports on the outside of our PC. They are connected to this input output controller board. Lots of different things. You can see a mini PCIe card here. Here are our SODIMs like in our laptops for our RAM or random access memory. A lot of similarities and you can see how it's kind of a hybrid with the parts between a desktop PC and a laptop.